don't have to follow the traditional financial advice. There are solutions. This report done by someone outside of our sphere of influence, they show you mathematically that buy-term invest difference is not the best strategy. We're gonna get rid of market risk. We're no longer going to accept just surviving. And we're no longer going to accept volatility as being the reason we run out of money. What if none of you had to worry about any of these risks? Welcome back everybody. Another week, another wealth webinar with Steven and myself for the first time in a few weeks. We've both been traveling to masterminds. I was in New Zealand. So I'm excited to be back here, but more importantly, I'm super excited about what we're going to talk about today. Before I get into the topic, how many of you think retirement is important? Put I in the chat. I just want to know how many of you really value retirement because I don't. You might think that's a stupid question, but I don't value retirement because I don't believe in retirement. I think it's a thing we've been taught to focus too much attention on when it's really every day could be re retirement to you if you're doing something you love, something that you really set your mind to. Retirement, I think to me, is just a period of time in your life. It doesn't have to be age 60 or 62 or 65, any period of time in your life where you literally have created freedom of time. That to me would be my definition of retirement is freedom of time. But I might have a warped sense of reality because most people work their entire life so that they can retire at the age of 60, 62, 67, maybe 70 years old to get their social security, to get their pension and to be able to tap into what? That's right. That retirement account, that 401k or 403b or IRA, whatever you want to call it. And what's the magic age that you can tap into your retirement account without an IRS 10% penalty? Who wants to put that in the chat? That's right, 59 and a half. 59 and a half. So really, when we think about the average person in the population, most folks are putting money into retirement accounts primarily 401ks. Some of you are, are working for governmental agencies, which will be a 457. Some of you are working for nonprofits like schools that, well, some schools, but that would be a 403b. No matter what the letters and numbers are in front of it, if it's a qualified retirement account, the rules of engagement are 59 and a half to avoid a 10% IRS penalty. That's it. And when we look at how much money is in qualified retirement plans, it's over $40 trillion. Yes, I said that right. $40 trillion. That's how much money is in retirement accounts in this country alone. I think that's this country alone. So if that's the case, well, then we got to do some, some reality checks about the problems with retirement. And I think today, what I want to do is I want to show you something that I used to do as a financial advisor, but then I want to layer in a couple extra levels of what we've learned after I stepped out of the, the financial advisor role and after Stephen stepped out of the financial advisor role. Because what many of you probably don't know is Stephen and I, we were both financial advisors. Yes, we were. Yep, we did it. We got our Series 7 licenses, 65, 66, 663s, all those numbers and letters after your name so that we could be your financial advisor and give you just the best advice in reality, most financial advisors just sell you a product. That's what they do. And uh, I hate to say it, but I did too. That's what we were trained to do. And the advice we gave our clients, although prudent advice, was really the advice that was passed down from our superiors, from our consultants. And a lot of times that advice kept you on the, rat, on the, the roller coaster, kept you in the rat race, because it all relied on that magic 59 and a half number. I can't tell you how many conversations I had with people planning the retirement distribution as to what it was going to look like that day that they sailed off into the sunset, commonly called retirement. So we're no longer financial advisors. I left in 2018. Stephen, when did you leave the hellhole, I guess I would call it? Well, long before, like 2008. Okay, so you, you left just right before, before that. Just right before. before the Great Recession? Just before, yeah. 
Dude, you checked out before the fun began, man. The best part of being an advisor was riding through 2008 and watching all your clients lose 30, 40, 50%, having them all call you and blame you and basically say, you know, they're losing everything and not knowing what to do. And you're just sitting there listening to the superiors. Oh, just keep your money in. And the only way to lose money is to sell. It's just a paper loss. You remember all that? Yeah, Maybe yeah. No, you didn't. You didn't get to do all that fun stuff. <laughs> I was stuff, still friends I... with many advisors, though, and, and still uh, communicated. And yes, all right. very clearly. So, no, let's talk PTSD, yes. Oh, it is PTSD, a rat race. So what I thought I would do today is I found these really interesting th the reports. They're, they're very thick. There's a lot. I would, I'm happy to give any one of you this report. So I'll give you an email in, uh, halfway through this where I can send you this report. But I want to tell you that this report was done by two guys way smarter than Stephen and I. One of the guys' names is Wade. He's got a lot of letters after his name. He's a PFAU, a PhD, a CFA. He's a professor of retirement income at the American College of Financial Services. Oh, my God. It just keeps going on and on. And then the other gentleman, Michael, he's a PhD, a CFP, the dean and chief academic officer at the American College of Financial Services. So anyway, let me tell you about folks like these. I've, I've met these individuals. They're brilliant. Some of you might know some of these people. They have lots of letters and things after their name. But what they fail to be able to do, in my opinion, is explain their level of knowledge to most people like you at a fifth grade level. I feel like everything they did in this report is talked at, at literally a high level that most individuals, most people that will read this will not understand a third of what is being said in here because of the jargon that they use, the, the financial terminology that they're using. So my effort today was to take this report, which I find fascinating, and articulate it to all of you in a fifth grade level, but add a little extra step that will basically allow all of you to mitigate the, the retirement income risks. So let's just go over those. Let's start here, okay? So when you retire, there are a whole bunch of risks you need to be aware of. Matter of fact, before you retire, there are a whole bunch of risks that you need to be aware of and plan for. Let's just go through those. Number one, market volatility. So what is market volatility? Well, it's this. It's when the market's going up, down, up, down, up, down. Always be aware of the market downs. How do you plan for market volatility when you retire? Because the worst possible thing that can happen in retirement is you retire. Let's just pretend you retire today. You start to take distributions from your retirement because you need an income, right? If you're going to check out and you're going to stop the W-2 or stop the income, you're going to need an income. So that's going to come from your assets, primarily your retirement account. So if your retirement account is invested in the market, you retire and all of a sudden you're taking income from that. And then all of a sudden, whoops, after the election, the market goes poo poo and crashes and burns. And you're taking income when your portfolio is down 30%. Actually, hold on. Let me ask all of you. What do you think the outcome is when you do that? Anyone want to tell me? What is the outcome if you start taking income from a declining portfolio when it loses 20, 30, 40% of its value? You have less money, but let's go one step further. What does that mean almost 100% of the time? Back to work. I love that. It disappears. But also, doesn't that just mean that you will run out of money and you will outlive the money that you have in retirement? Yeah, that's another risk. That is called longevity risk. And with modern science and modern healthcare, I was just meeting with one of my clients who's a doctor and we were just kind of riffing. He's retired and I, and I manage his retirement stuff. And we were talking about it. And he's like, you know, medicine has come so far. You know, back when I did this surgery, this is how we did it. Now today, they just do this little thing up your vein and we don't even have to cut you open. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. All of that leads to one thing. We are living longer. Don't believe we're living longer? Then why did mortality tables for life insurance companies go from us being killed off at 100, literally all old whole life policies or any life insurance had an, a, a basically a mortality table of 100 years old. Can anyone tell me how long mortality, ta mortality tables go to today? Who can tell me that? How long are they? Yeah, that's right, 121, Rick. And you were very close, Lucy. So they're saying we literally have the potential to live to 121. Well, let's just talk about retirement. If you retire, 
and you're like, well, I'm, I'm going to be around till about 90 years old, which when we did retirement planning, I'm not going to lie to you. When I was an advisor, usually we planned for retirement to about age 90. Do you remember that, Stephen? We always had like a, a date where we killed our clients off, like on paper. Clearly, we, we didn't actually kill our clients off. But on paper, we <laughs> we had to end the retirement somewhere. Might have wanted like, to every now and then. But, uh, <laughs> well, hey, so when did they make that change from 100 to 121? Do you know? Oh, Wait, gosh. Yeah. Um, because I was talking to what, a broker in Canada this past week, and they told me they still they still end at 100. So he's actually delivered a few policies that ended, but they're still alive to clients. Yeah, I thought that wow. was cool. Yeah. And, and folks, I don't know if you know that. What Stephen just said is, if you if you had a, a old whole life policy, and it had a, a basically they call it an endowment, it ended at age 100. Does everybody think that the insurance company just keeps your money, or what do you think happens when it endows? The insurance company gives you all of your money, your entire death benefit while you're living. So like Stephen's saying that, like he's got people in Canada that literally lived past their, their endowment date, the end of their contract. And the insurance company literally will just cut you a check for the entire death benefit. How many of you want that to happen? Well, in the US, you got to live to 121. Sorry. But yeah, that. that's, that's because of modern science and healthcare. So longevity risk is a super important thing to focus on because there is a strong probability that you will outlive your retirement income. And then what are you going to do? You're going to just call your kids and say, Hey, Johnny, got some bad news, buddy. Yeah, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Mom's fine too. No, that's not the kind of problem we got. We're, we're healthy. That's the problem. And then little Johnny says, no, dad, like, that's not a problem at all. Like, I'm glad you're healthy. Like what, what's the problem? Well, Johnny, because we lived so long and we're still healthy, son of a bitch, we have outlived our money. We no longer have any money left. So, Johnny, I'm literally calling you and begging you. Can you help support our lifestyle? Can you pay for the food and the rent? You know, I know we sold the big house and we're living in this tiny little shack called an apartment, but, you know, we can't afford that. Because Social Security's only given us two thousand dollars a month, and rent is twenty two hundred dollars a month. We got a little dilemma here, Johnny. I mean, that's that's like that's reality, and I don't want that to be any of your reality because we got to stop thinking like the ninety five percent, and we got to start thinking like the five percent. Who are the five percent? Those are the ones who are financially secure into retirement. Those are the wealthy folks. Those are the people who made it and who don't worry about outliving their money. And they don't worry about these risks because they've mitigated against them. Now, I'd love to sit here and tell you that all this that I'm going to tell you today is all my idea. It's not. It's these two guys that are way smarter than Stephen and I. But what I've done is I've put this, Stephen saying we're smarter, but... That could be argued. According to letters and numbers after their name, they're smarter. According to just like being able to explain it and actually articulate it to all of you, I think we definitely win the race there. I'll let all of you decide whether we're smarter or they're smarter at the end of this, okay? There's no prize for that. Just you can use your own opinion. So another risk is taxes. I do this all the time and Stephen does this all the time. When we present, we always ask everybody, do you think taxes are going up or down? Everybody always says taxes are going up, especially now with the dude in charge and everything that's going on and the deficit in this country. I think taxes have to go up. So that's another big risk. We got to worry about taxes going up because if we plan our retirement and our retirement income at a tax rate of 28%, and then all of a sudden, unbeknownst to us and not related to us making more money, tax rates go to 35%, just hypothetically saying they raise them. That means you have less income to live on and you have nothing you can do about that. How about sequence of returns risk? So what is sequence of returns risk? Well, it's, it's the returns you get in the sequence of when you receive those. Let me kind of, it kind of ties into market volatility. If the markets go up, down, up, down. Well, the sequence of the return risk is when you start taking an income from your retirement but then the market goes down, the sequence of the returns goes down, and you still have to take an income from that portfolio. Now, most good financial advisors would shift the portfolio to bonds, but what happens if a time like right now is going on? The markets are going down, the Fed raises interest rates up, and the price of your bonds just went down. I mean, isn't that why Silicon Valley Bank went de defunct, went you know, illiquid? 
That is exactly what happened. When they were taking money out to support all the withdrawal requests, the run on the bank, the bonds that, that supported their deposits had lost so much value because interest rates went up. So even if you're in bonds, you still have the sequence of return risk because if interest rates go up right when you need to take money from your safe money, which is bonds, then all of a sudden you're taking money out at a much lower value than you paid for those bonds. Hence, making it so problem number two. So if we just number these, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Problem number one, market volatility can also play a factor into longevity risk. Sequence of returns risk plays a, a big factor in longevity risk. You will outlive your money. These are real, folks. I'm trying to get you to just see these risks. Healthcare risks. We talked about how healthcare keeps you keeps you alive longer, but healthcare isn't getting any cheaper. I know Obamacare was supposed to solve all healthcare problems, but boy, all, all I see from where I stand is that healthcare got way more expensive. Anyone else see it any differently? Does anyone think Obamacare actually made healthcare cheaper? Because I'm not seeing it. And I used to sell healthcare. And I remember when that came out, I'm like, oh, thank God we need prices to go down. Prices went up. It's crazy how that works. How about inflation risk? We just came through an inflationary period. Some would say it was a hyperinflationary period where cost of goods goes up. They just raised um, minimum wage to $20. So that means that everything without inflation is going to go up just because they have to pay their workers more, which other workers that were making 21 now have to make 23. Workers making 23 have to make 27. Do you see the domino effect? So we got inflation risk. And the one risk that these two brilliant gentlemen in the report failed to mention which I think is a real risk right now, and me and Stephen talk about this on a daily basis, debt risk. I think that's real. I think a lot of households are retiring with debts. Debts on their house, okay, their mortgages, debts on their cars, their car loans, credit card debt. Because of inflation risks and other things, they all of a sudden have had to go into getting going into debt just to be able to support their lifestyle. So when they go into retirement, their debts don't just banish, right? Just because you decide to stop going to work and work in 10 to or nine to, what do people work nowadays? Is it 10 to three? Is it nine to five? It used to be nine to five. Now I think it's actually more like 10 to three based on traffic patterns, but I could be off on that. And that, so that four day work week's coming too. Oh, oh yes. Forgot about the four day work week. We're only going to have to work four days. That's going to be Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. Anyway. So these are the risks and they all create this thing called Massive uncertainty. But what if none of you had to worry about any of these risks? They're all going to be there. But what if you just didn't give a shit about them? What if you just said, you know what? None of these are really going to affect me. This one's going to suck, taxes. Healthcare risk is going to suck. But I'm not going to have any debt. Inflation can piss off. But market volatility, I'm not going to worry about market volatility. And Chris, you really I, didn't I have love, to worry about those. I love that you didn't even mention Social Security on here because- Because they won't have it. Right. If you just saw the report that Yellen came out with last week, $175 trillion gap in Social Security funding. So that's not going to be there. So this is an interesting one. I want to hit one comment. Rhonda said, Chris, prices went up because of fraud. I do employer audits sometimes, people saying that they are married and their girlfriends get pregnant and, and claims are filed. This is why employers are making their employees verify their dependents uh, or their dependents are true dependents. I, I totally get it, Rhonda. And, and I'm not blaming Obamacare. Listen, sometimes I just rant. Um, you know, Obamacare is what it is. There's a lot of reasons healthcare goes up. I mean, the cost of care has gone up. You're right. There's a ton of fraud out there in the healthcare system. So there's a lot of reasons healthcare went up. I don't know why I chose to pick on Obamacare. I just remember I was selling health insurance through Obamacare and everybody in our brokerage thought that health, healthcare was going to go down in cost, but it actually went up. That was all. But obviously, you know, lower income folks really benefited from Obamacare. Uh, people like my mom, to be honest with you, she was able to get health care, which she wasn't able to get before. So let's dive into this. I don't want to waste any more time. You know the risks. Stephen and myself, standing where we are, our job is to mitigate your risks. Every financial advisor should understand that their number one job, their number one job is to help you not lose money. I think financial advisors have it in their mind, and I think a lot of clients have it in their mind, that the financial advisor's job is to make them money. Let me, let me correct you. A financial advisor and a monkey are no different in an up market. 
They will both make you money. A monkey will throw darts at a, at a board of stocks or mutual funds or ETFs and you'll make money. A financial advisor will pick them with fancy software like Morningstar or eMoney and, and you'll probably make about the same, whether you decide to have a monkey throw darts, your, your three-year-old throw darts, or you, you pay a high, high fee advisor. It's basically the same in an up market, but where the rubber meets the road, and I think this is where the industry is really backwards, is an advisor's job is to protect you when shit falls apart. It's to protect you when everything isn't going good, when the markets are going up, when the markets are in turmoil. That's when a financial advisor's true colors come out, which is why I'm so surprised in talking to the thousands of people we do at the Money School BYOB and the Money Multiplier, why we hear so little about financial advisors recommending or, or talking to their clients about possibly backing down their risk tolerances and moving portfolio risk into a more conservative investment strategy. We hear that so little. And I think right now would be an exact time when you should start looking at being more conservative. But today we're not here to talk about that. I'm just talking about protecting you for your retirement and how to mitigate those risks. And it's very simple. But in this report that I, like I said, I will happily send this report to every single one of you. As a matter of fact, let's do that right now. So if any of you want to get this report, which you probably won't be able to articulate or understand, but nonetheless, I'll send it to you. All you're going to do is send Shauna an email. Actually, here, let's not do Shauna because she'll be mad. Let's do contact at <laughs> chrisnoggle.com. Give us a few days because I have not given them this report. I've just got it all marked up and highlighted. I spent all weekend reviewing this, studying this, and making sure that I could articulate this in a fifth level or fifth grade level. So there you go. There's there's the email, contact at chrisnoggle.com. I will send you this report. Okay, so let's talk about what this all looks like. So when you listen to gurus, and every one of you know that I constantly am doing videos debunking Dave Ramsey, literally debating Dave Ramsey because he won't actually live debate me. And Dave Ramsey teaches one strategy. Can anyone tell me what Dave Ramsey's strategy is, please? What is Dave Ramsey's main strategy? Okay, buy and hold, but what else? Pay down debt, yep. No, what's his strategy? How does he show you how to pay down debt? Keep you poor, I love that. It's the proper answer, Felix. Buy term, invest the difference. Buy term and invest the difference. So in this report, they fully articulate that strategy, because it is a strategy that not just Dave Ramsey talks about, I just pick on him, but it's a strategy that financial advisors are taught. I know I was taught it, you know, for retirement, because why would you want to do buy term invest the difference? Well, let me just show you. If you just did your protection, because in retirement, you need to have protection as well. Throughout your life, you need to protect for the unforeseen. If you die today, you need to make sure that your family is protected. And if you don't care about your family, please leave this webinar because this is not going to help you at all. Because nothing that I teach, nothing I teach is for selfish people. This is for people that actually love their families, love their kids, want to make sure that their kids are left in a better place if they're not here. And that's, that's the only people I speak to. So if you're not one of those people, if you're all about yourself, if you don't give a shit about your kids, hit the end button. I'm not talking to you from here on out. But for the rest of you, buy term invest the difference logically kind of seems to make some sense, doesn't it? Because if you buy term insurance, let's just call this a 20-year term, you're getting protection, pure protection against dying for a period of 20 years at a bargain basement price of a thousand. Let's just call it, I'm making this number up. So uh, disclaimer, I do need to do the disclaimer here, actually. So I'm going to give you guys a disclaimer here real quick. So here we go. I'm going to read this real quick. Any opinions expressed by me or my castmates is solely our own individual opinions and not investment or personal financial advice. This content is for informational purposes only, and this information should not be relied upon for investment or other financial decisions. Nothing contained herein is financial, legal, or tax advice. Chris Noggle, any castmates or PMC or its members, employees, and contractors may receive compensation from... I don't need to read this one because these two really smart gentlemen that did this report are not paying us anything. So nothing I'm talking about today pays us. This is literally free advice for all of you. So anyway, what I was saying is my opinion about buy term invest difference is term insurance is pure and per, pure protection. And it is viewed by most people, including Dave Ramsey, as being the cheapest life insurance you can buy. 
Now, Stephen and I will tell you that it is not the cheapest life insurance you can buy. It is actually the most expensive life insurance, but perception is not always reality because most people will look at term and be like, no way, term is cheap. Because if I buy a term policy, it's going to cost me $1,000, hypothetically, for a $1 million worth of coverage. So I get a $1 million worth of coverage for $1,000. If I bought a whole life policy for a million bucks, that might cost me five or 8,000 bucks. That's a big difference, Chris. Whole life's way more expensive than term. Okay, let me ask you this. If you live 21 years, how expensive was that term insurance? Wasn't it $20,000? Okay. If you, if you bought whole life and you lived 21 years, how expensive was that life insurance when you die in the 21st year? Not expensive at all. Because two things will have happened. You will have built up a cash value that has exceeded the amount of premiums you paid. So you literally got all the money back in cash value. Secondarily, if you died the 21st year, what does your family get? They actually get a death benefit. Yeah. And even if you live 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, as long as you don't make it to 121, well, actually, if you make it to 121, we already covered that. You get a check then too. So you see, now, is term really the cheapest? No. Term just allows you to lay out the least amount of money for a period of time to buy pure protection for a term of time, which enables somebody to build up and put more money into their retirement account. So that's exactly where the case study starts. So hear me out. Let's just pretend this gentleman, or let's let's use a female. Let's call this Sue. I'm just making this up. This is Sue, okay? Sue goes with the traditional buy-term invested difference strategy. And throughout her working life, she buys a 20-year term insurance policy for $1,000 a year, has a million dollars should she die prematurely. And she's able to, at the age of retirement, let's call retirement age 62 years old, she's able to then have $2.5 million in retirement assets. The only reason she has $2.5 million is because she didn't have to spend money on that stupid, overly priced whole life insurance. She was able to put all the money into the 401k. Everybody follow where I'm at. Fifth grade level. I mean, some of you are like, can you go a little faster? And Stephen, if anyone hits a question, can you make sure you stop me and ask? I, I, I don't need to stay on track with this. So everything looks good here, right? Because the next scenario, what I'm going to do, I just want to go ahead a little bit and then I'm going to come back and there's a very good reason for this. The next strategy we're going to look at, we're going to look at the same person, Sue, and Sue puts the money into a whole life policy instead of putting it into the 401k. And the net result is she only has $2 million. So Sue with buy term and invested difference has $2.5 million in her 401k. But if she did the whole life, she's only going to have $2 million. Why? Well, because the 500,000 had to fund the whole life. That's the only part of the story. Everybody follows that. So real quick, let me pause. Which one do you think is better? Is Sue better buying term invested difference? So she has 2.5 or is Sue better putting money in the 401k, have 2 million in the 401k, and then have the, the other 500,000 had to go to whole life? Which one do you think is better right now? I just want to gauge the audience. So a lot of times people would think this is better. Why? Because they have more money in the 401k. So cheaper is better in this case, right? Even if I outlive the, four, the term insurance, even if I no longer have a million dollars in coverage, hey, at least I got $5 million more in my 401k. Now let's go on to the next step. You're age 62. Sue turns 62. She retires. She's done. She's so excited. The big retirement party cracks the champagne, goes home, and now she gets to golf or go out with her girlfriends every single day for the rest of her life. But she needs an income to do this. So her financial advisor sets up a distribution plan from her 401k. They adjust the portfolio to 60% stock, 40% bonds. That used to be what we called the efficient frontier, 60-40. It was kind of like what was known as like the ultimate strategy until 2008 happened and destroyed that strategy, but it was called the efficient frontier. So everything's good, right? Now let's just assume here, let me just use the same numbers. Let's use the same numbers. So let's just assume that Sue, to maintain her lifestyle, needs to earn $80,000 a year. That's what she needs in income. Where would that income come from? Forget about social security. So let's just pretend social security is no longer, which it probably won't be. Where would that money come from? I love this audience. Todd's like terms is just like renting. You're right. You're right. But let's, let's get on with the retirement part. The income's got to come from her 401k, right? So she starts taking $80,000 a year. So this is year one in retirement, 62. 63 happens next year. An election has happened. 
World's a little bit in turmoil. The markets drop, which often happens after an election. She has to take $80,000 to live, but she has to take $80,000 from a declining market because the stock market's on its way down. Okay, stock market's going down. Sue still has to live. Doesn't matter that the markets are going down. Let's just assume she says 60, 40, markets are going down. Now she takes 80 grand from her portfolio. It's a major problem. There's a major problem because by her doing that, like even if it's just one year that early on in her retirement will significantly, significantly impact her chances as per this article, significantly, and they have percentages and everything in here, impact her chances of being able to retire at $80,000 for the rest of her life based on her longevity. One downward market, just one downward market and one income taken from that downward income means Sue will run out of money. And the math is all done by these guys that are way smarter than us. And I can't remember when they said she runs out, but she absolutely runs out of money. And let's just assume, and, and, and these guys actually were really conservative. She takes that 80 grand out when her portfolio is only down 20%. Now, you know, I'd probably say it's going to go down more than 20%. But in this particular example, we're just going to assume a 20% drop. That's it. Just 20%. She takes 80 grand. She will run out of money. She will run out of money. How many of you have a solution to solve this problem? This is longevity risk, market risk, and sequence of uh, return risk. What would be the obvious thing to do here? Some of you would say, well, what if she, her advisor had moved her portfolio into a really conservative of a bond or conservative portfolio of bonds? Well, I'm glad you asked that because they actually do that entire study here and that is on page seven, they talk about sequential return risk of bonds. And they go into, they talk about cash, intermediate term bonds and long-term bonds. And they do an average return from 1926 to 1917. It doesn't change the scenario. It helps it a little bit, but she will still run out of money. Okay, so everybody knows where we're at right now, right? Buy term invest the difference. The biggest risk here are all the risks. Number one, you're gonna outlive your money. You're more than likely, actually, you got about a 98% chance that you're gonna outlive your life insurance. So if you did outlive your life insurance, you make it to age 21, term's gone, you no longer have life insurance, but that's okay, because Dave Ramsey said, we'll be self-insured, because we will, we will have taken the difference, you know, term, invest the difference, taken the difference, put it into the 401k, which gave us an extra $5 million, but in one swoop, downward pressure of the market, it took 300 of our 500,000 gone in the market, gone. And you took a, a withdrawal from the downward market at 20%. So you are pretty much effed, you're screwed. So let's move on. This is where it starts to get fun. So now we're gonna call this strategy, the covered asset strategy. So a couple of things are gonna change. Sue, did not follow the traditional guru's advice of buy term invest the difference. No, no, no. Sue went out and rediverted 500,000. Well, it's not actually a full 500,000, but let's just keep numbers simple, fifth grade level. She moves 500,000 that would have went into her 401k into a whole life insurance policy. Forget about whether it's specially designed or just off the shelf. She just moves it into a whole life insurance policy. And at the same time, at age 62, all the things the same for Sue, she retires. At the age of 62, when she retires, that 500,000 she put into the whole life has a million dollar death benefit and $700,000 in cash value. This is probably a pretty accurate scenario because if somebody had bought a whole life policy for 20 years and paid into it for 20 years, if you put 500 in, you'd probably actually have more than 700. See, I'm going really conservative because I don't wanna overpromise and underdeliver. Steven, you've seen all the illustrations we do. There's no way in hell you'd only have $700,000 if you put 500 into a whole life over 20 years. You'd have way more. But let's just keep things simple and super believable by Dave Ramsey standards, okay? Because whole life is the worst place you can put your money, right? Yeah, okay. So now you got yourself a whole life policy. So what have we eliminated? Well, we, re we eliminated longevity risk because you're not gonna outlive your death benefit. So now, even if you deplete your 401k down, to zero. So in this scenario, the covered asset strategy, what asset did we cover? The 401k. Because if we spend the 401k down to zero, because we're living off of that money, which is what your retirement account's for, right? Here's another common mistake. 
A lot of folks save their money their whole life into their 401k or retirement accounts with the hope, because I'm going to use the word hope, that they're going to live off that money. But you know what? If they die, that money is going to pass on to their, their family. The family is going to get all the 401k. I want all of you right now to draw a line in the sand. Whatever money you have in your 401k, I want you to freaking blow it. I want you to spend all of it in your lifetime. I want you, this is a game. This is your challenge. I challenge you to spend 100% of the money in your 401k to live the best life ever. Because you know what? We work our whole lives and then we've got, what, another 20, 30 years to live. If we're lucky when we retire, that's going to be our best years. You're going to build your bucket list. You're going to jump out of planes. You're going to bungee jump. You're going to go whitewater rafting. You're going to race Porsches. You're going to freaking do all sorts of crazy stuff. But it's all going to cost you all the money in your 401k. That's the challenge I have for you. Because in this strategy, the covered asset strategy, it doesn't matter because we took out pure whole life protection, which means when you die, that 401k is going to be replaced by the death benefit. Okay. And, and listen, I could just change the number because it probably would be more like 2 million, but let's just keep it at a million bucks to keep things simple here for today. Everybody follows what I'm doing here. I, I covered the 401k asset with a whole life policy for our whole life. But then we're going to do one other thing. We're going to get rid of some risk. We're going to get rid of market risk. We're going to cover rent. We're going to cover groceries. We're going to cover health care bills. We're going to cover all the bills in your household that you know come every single month. So I want you to think about your monthly expenses. I want you to think which bills that you pay now are going to be bills you're going to pay when you're retired. Those are your, your common bills that you're used to paying and that are going to exist forever. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what those bills are. So for Sue, in this strategy, those bills are 30000 of the $80,000 that she needs to live. The remaining amount of the 30 to 80 is just going to be blown on golfing and booze and jumping out of planes and all sorts of stuff. Okay. 30,000 is necessary to maintain their standard of living. So they never have to call Johnny and ask Johnny, their son for extra money. Got it. So how are we going to provide $30,000 in guaranteed income for the entire duration of your lifetime, no matter how long you live? Well, Leave that to this report and leave that to insurance companies. They created a vehicle called a single premium immediate annuity. I never talk about these, but we're, we're doing this because this is something that we can offer. We can do this kind of planning for all of you, but I'm not doing this to try to sell all of you on the strategy. I'm trying to teach you something, but a single premium immediate annuity. How that works is just like it says, single premium. We're going to put money into it one time. And that money that we give the insurance company is going to guarantee in income for the rest of your life. There's a little bit more to it. Like you could guarantee it for the rest of your life and your spouse's life. You could guarantee it for the rest of your life, your spouse's life, and, and some of it for your kid's life. You can do all sorts of things, but for the rest of your life. So what would that cost? Or how much would I need to take out of the 401k and put into the single premium immediate annuity to provide 30,000? Well, I don't know, but as of the report that I'm looking at, let's just say it was thirty or $300,000 of the one or the $2 million. So what does that leave? That leaves 1.7 million in the 401k because the 300,000, what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll it over, qualified rollover into a qualified single premium immediate annuity with a mutually owned insurance company that has good ratings. And they are gonna then promise in a contract to pay you 30,000 or pay Sue 30,000 for the rest of Sue's life. It doesn't matter if the markets are up, down, sideways, doesn't matter if we're in World War III, $30,000 is going to be paid every single, every single year for the rest of her life. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So now what did we do? Well, we covered the assets because now in the event of a strong downward market, which we do have these things represented here, she doesn't need to take as much money from the 401k because 30,000 of the money is covered by the single premium immediate annuity. That's a pretty cool thing, right? So strategy number two, we've covered our assets. We've covered the death benefit so that we don't outlive the death benefit like we would with term. And now we've covered at least a portion of the withdrawals that we need to take. However, we didn't solve the complete problem. And this report goes into really dissecting this. And I just want to show you what you can get with this report. If you email contact at Chris Noggle, see all these fancy numbers. 
Each one of these is a strategy and a scenario like I'm walking you through. I'm going to change it up in a little bit away from what they do because I think I got a better way to do this. But these show you mathematical certainty and through Monte Carlo simu simulations shows you why you'd be better off with this strategy over the first strategy. You absolutely have a lower chance of running out of money with this than you did with the first strategy. But there is a possibility you will run out of money because remember, if we need 80 and we've only got 30 coming in guaranteed, well, then we still need to take withdrawals. And if we take a withdrawal when the market's going down for the remaining amount, well, we still got a problem. We still got a problem of 50,000 still had to come out of a downward market. So we could potentially still run out of money. At least we don't have to call Johnny to cover our basic expenses, but no more, no more nights out with the girls, no more jumping out of planes, racing Porsches, all that fun activity shit that we wanted to do in our, our retirement, out the window. We're just surviving. How many of you want to just survive? How many of you want, uh, just in the chat, okay, Candy said no. How many of you want to protect yourself just to survive? No fun, no planes, no booze, no golfing, no nights out, just survive. Thank you. Ricky, Ricky nailed it. Hell no, negative. All right, so, so then you could all assume right now that we haven't solved your problems because I've only solved the problem to get you to cover your assets and I've solved the problem to get you to just survive, but we still have risk of running out of money. Okay, let's keep going. One quick question. Can you borrow against the 300,000 rolled over from the 401k to buy SPI? No. So when the money moves from the 401k into the single premium immediate annuity, this 300,000 that moved into here, that money is locked up. You can never touch the 300k. All you're going to get is 30,000. Think of this like a pension. This is how pensions work. A pension, okay? The the company you work for that used to give you a pension has a bunk, bunch of money when you retire, they basically literally annuitize that money. They literally do a very similar strategy where they find an insurance company that will provide a guaranteed income for the rest of their, their life. And they try to be able to buy that income at a discount so the pension has enough money. So that's essentially what you're doing. So you have none of that 300,000 can be used. You can't borrow against it. However, in a single premium immediate annuity, one cool thing is if you died okay, early, a portion of this 300,000 would be sent to your beneficiary. So there's a calculation the insurance company does. It says, okay, we only had to pay out for 10 years of what would have been an entire lifetime. So we only used 190,000 of the 300. We're going to send your family the rest. Plus you get the death benefit. Fair enough. So you cannot borrow against that. Uh, do you get 30,000 starting immediately? Yeah, you get to pick that Ricky. So in a single premium immediate annuities, you can pick and choose when you want the income to start. But let's just for today, assume that Sue does this the day she retires. So her income is going to start the second, the, like she puts the money in the single premium annuity and then 30 days later, she gets a check. Let's just make that as an assumption. However, in your real life scenario, if you decided to do this and work with our team to help design this, you could pick and choose whenever you want that money to start. And you could pick and choose when you want that money to end, if you ever want it to end. You could even pick and choose of how much you want your spouse to get should you die too soon. You could do a cash refund option. You could do a survivorship with an additional income that would be paid to your kids if you and your spouse died. So again, it gets really uh, fancy. But if any of you have ever looked at a pension, you know, and when you retire from a pension, you have all those options too. You know, single, joint, joint with survivorship. You guys, have, you guys have seen this before. I'm not telling you anything you haven't seen. You've just never seen it done in an individual basis. Maybe some of you have, but this is probably new to some of you. Um, any additional questions on that before I move on to solving the remaining? Uh, who makes all the rules over, over all our hard-earned money? So Abby's saying, who makes all the rules over our hard-earned money? Okay, that's a good question. So you make all the rules of the 401k money, okay? Because you're over 59 and a half. You can make all the rules of what happens with the whole life policy. But remember in this strategy, we just took the whole life out to make sure that we had a death benefit till the day we died. That was the only purpose of the whole life in this case. You notice how I never talked about the cash value. We just did that, that's covered asset. And then the single premium annuity, you have nothing to do with where that 300,000 goes. The insurance company just gives you a guaranteed contract that pays you 30,000 a year for the rest of your life for all intents and purposes. Fair enough? Can you skip a year? Oh, sure. Well, well, 
The 30,000. Once you start the income, you can't stop the income, but you could, you could delay the start of that income, which would then give you a higher income. So let's just say you said you did a single premium immediate annuity, but you didn't need the income to start this year or even next year. So you wanted to delay, to delay that income for two years. Instead of getting 30,000 a year starting immediately, you might get 32,000 a year. Follow what I'm saying? So you just get more because it's all based on actuarial tables and longevity. So how long are you going to live? How much does the insurance company have to guarantee? And how, how much can they make on your money to provide you a return? And then there's always a return. And I think single premium immediate annuities right now are probably in the 5 to 6% range. I would guess. I, I mean, there's a lot of variables in that. But when we look at your individual situation, that's about where you're going to be at. Yeah, don't worry about how much money you have or don't have in a 401k right now. We're, we're literally just going through the strategy. Fair enough? Let me keep going because I want to... I want to make sure to get into the good stuff because we haven't even got into the good stuff. There's too many holes in plan one, lots of holes in plan one by term invested difference. And there's a lot of holes in the covered asset strategy too. So we got to start slowly through these different strategies, plugging the holes. And now this is where I get to have some fun. Now I get to have a lot of fun here. So now I want you to picture, I want you to picture sailing a boat. You got yourself a sailboat. When you go out into the open waters in your sailboat and you hoist the sails, what is required in order for your sailboat to go and to go fast? Wind. But what happens when the wind completely shuts off in a sailboat? All you're going on is the current. Well, I want you to think of the stock market as exactly the same, which is why I drew this little guy down here in his sailboat. He's not mad, but he's not happy because the wind isn't blowing really strong. Now, in a sailboat, compare it to the stock market. We need the markets to be performing. We need a bull market in order for the stock market to really put wind behind our sail. And our, our boat, this is your retirement, okay? Your retirement works better when there's a strong wind. And the strong wind is a strong stock market. So in this strategy, we are still going to rely on a strong stock market for ultimate success, okay? But we're going to now change one thing. And we're going to change the name. This is going to be called pure volatility buffer strategy. Got that? This is the pure volatility buffer strategy. I know that's a mouthful. So just think of it as PV buffer strategy, pure volatility. So we want to eliminate any volatility risk 100%. How the heck do we do that? In the last strategy, the covered asset strategy, we did that by buying a single premium immediate annuity with a portion of our 401k. And folks, I want to be, I want to be, uh, give a disclaimer here. I'm just making these numbers up based on this report that I've got. Okay. Your numbers are going to differ from Sue's. Sue is just a, a made up person. Okay. I just picked the name out of the sky. Your numbers will differ. It might not be 2 million. It might be 4 million. It might not be 4 million. It might be 500,000. It doesn't matter. The strategy is all I want you to focus on. Please don't focus on the numbers because literally the numbers, I just pull them out of the sky. I just picked easy numbers to do math on. That's all I really did. They are not exact numbers. They, they have no merit behind them. Your, your results would probably be far better than what I'm showing, but I'm just trying to just give you the strategy. The numbers are just going to be your numbers, which we'll put together for you. The strategy is what I'm trying to teach you here. Is that fair enough? Like you just trying to get the strategy and eliminate the risks. The numbers, mood point. Pure volatility buffer strategy. Let's go. Everything is the same. The 401k, we no longer have 2.5 million. We only have two. Why? Well, just like before, we moved 500,000 into a whole life. Why did we buy the whole life? Well, we wanted to make sure that our family would get a million dollars if we should die too early. We didn't like the term strategy because we, we know the probability of us living longer than that term of time that that pure protection gives us is, is in the insurance company's favor to the tune of 98 plus percent in the tune of the insurance company's favor because less than 2% of all term insurance is paid out. So we did a whole life policy. But remember, in the last strategy, I mentioned that that 500,000 that we moved to the whole life over those 20 years has grown to 700,000. But in the last strategy, we didn't touch the cash value. We never used the cash value because we wanted the maximum death benefit. Well, in this strategy, the pure volatility buffer strategy, we are going to use the cash value. And here's how we're going to use it. We're still going to move 300000 over to the SPIA. The SPIA is going to give us 30000 in guaranteed income. Okay, so taxable? Got, I'm sorry? 
Is the 30K taxable? Yes. That okay. is it, it, well, if the SPIA was a if this is a Roth 401k, then that income would be tax free. Right. So if it's a traditional, which most of you probably have a traditional 401k, then you're going to roll it into a traditional SPIA. Cool. And that is going to be taxable income. Yes. Remember, I said tax in tax risk is there, but we're going to mitigate tax tax risk in the next one. But here we're getting rid of volatility and we got rid of the, the risk of uh, running out of money too early. So here, unlike the last one, what we're going to do is we're no longer going to accept just surviving. And we're no longer going to accept volatility as being the reason we run out of money. Okay. And that's what this report does. This report now adds one step. And now what we're going to do, and over this report, here's what we have the advantage of is, does anyone know the business that we're in? Stephen and I are in the business of teaching you how to take back control of your money. And we do that by teaching you how to be the bank. And to be the bank, we teach you how to create a banking system using a specially designed and engineered whole life insurance policy. So up to this point, I didn't say anything about the whole life. I just said it was a whole life. But now we're actually going to design this whole life to be high cash value. So before it was 700000 Now let's just up the ante and let's just say it's now $750,000. I'm just increasing it a little bit because I want you to see the difference. So now because we build the whole life differently, we have 750000 in cash value. And let's just drop the death benefit down a little because we're never going to have as much death benefit when we build these. We've got $800,000 in death benefit, but that's okay. We're not so much worried about a little bit lower death benefit because we know now we've got more cash value. So in this strategy, we've protected 30,000 of the $80,000 in income. We have $1.7 million invested in the same portfolio, 60, 40 stocks and bonds. Okay. And I'm not making a recommendation. I'm just going off of like what most people do, 60, 40. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take income from the 401k only when the market's up. So when the market's going up and we're making money and we got wind behind our sale, let's just, let's just do the wind this way. Probably makes more sense to have the wind going in front. Okay. Now our boat, actually, no, I did that right the first time. We got the wind going this way. So now our boat is moving the right direction because we've got wind of the positive market. But next year, after the election, the market's down 20% and we still need $80,000. So where is that 80 grand going to come from? Steven, do you know? Pure volatility buffer. Can anyone on here tell me where we're going to take $80,000 from when the markets are down? Who can tell me? Ha, Ricky, got it. We're going to go into our whole life insurance and we're going to take $80,000 from that $750,000 because our whole life is guaranteed to never have less money the next year than it did the prior year. You are guaranteed, no matter what the market does, no matter what the economy does, to grow your money in a whole life, guaranteed. You can never ever lose money in a whole life. Why? Well, I, I gotta be careful saying that because if you started a whole life and canceled the whole life in the first year, two years, you could lose money. But if you keep the whole life, like I'm explaining, your whole life will have more money and it will continue to grow on a guaranteed interest rate. So this is our buffer, okay? Because anytime the market's down, we're gonna take income and I'm gonna change the color just so it's easier for everybody to see. So now, when the markets are down, I'm going to do it with a bright blue. The 80,000 I write here is coming from 80,000 of the death of the, the uh, whole life. So when we take 80 grand from the 750, what are we doing? Well, if we take it as a loan, we're taking 80,000 from the death benefit too. But that's okay because remember, we're not just focusing on this 800K as a death benefit. We're having this cash value go to work. And by the cash value going to work, what does that allow our 401k to do? Continue to grow because we never take withdrawals from the 401k in a down market because we don't want to touch the 401k money unless the markets are up, unless our portfolio is up because then we never have the drawdown effect and we can do what we always say we want to do, invest for the long haul. You now can't because you built a buffer. So 80,000, every time the market's down, we take 80,000. Every time the market's up, we take 80,000. Actually, sorry, and I'm doing my numbers wrong. Shoot, screw that up. Surprised somebody didn't catch me. We're only taking 50 grand, remember? Not 80, 50. 
because we got 30 covered by the single premium immediate annuity. So now we're only drawing down 50,000 from the whole life in down markets. And we're only taking 50,000 from the 401k when the market's up. So 50 from the market up, 50 from the market down from the whole life. Okay, everybody understands what we're doing. So that's strategy number three, very quick, very simple, but everybody understands that, right? And Dave, Daniel asked the question about 60 stocks, 40 bonds. So let me just kind of explain that. Traditionally, in the financial world, a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio was viewed back in the day. There was actually a whole thing, uh, Markovics, I think is the guy's name. You could Google it. I think it was uh, something Markovics. He came up with this thing called the Efficient Frontier. And the Efficient Frontier was the ultimate investment strategy for retirement. It was 60-40. It was supposed to have enough bonds to protect when the markets were down and enough stock to grow when the markets were up. It's all out the window, okay? Because 2008 destroyed that, that strategy, but it's still in the minds of most financial advisors, one of the better strategies of 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Again, not recommending that. I'm just doing it as an example. All right, so here... Strategy number three, we've, we've done better than we did strategy number one, because now we never have to draw money out of our 401k when the markets are down, because we have a buffer. We no longer can outlive our death benefit because we've protected the death benefit for our entire life. And we've guaranteed that we're never going to have to call Johnny, our son or daughter, and, and beg them, telling them, oh my God, there's a bad thing that's happened. We've run, out, we've run out of money because you've covered your basic expenses. But now you also have covered your fun money, because you're not going to have to worry about your 401k running out of money when you're not drawing it down when it's going down. Do you see what I'm saying? If you only took money from your 401k when the market was up, your chance of running out of money is diminished significantly. I mean, you could always make mistakes and start taking huge withdrawals from your 401k. And then yes, you're going to run out of money. But if we designed a retirement strategy, and this report talks about a four to 5% drawdown, typically that's about what they use a 4% drawdown. So if you only took 4 to 5% of your 401k each, each year, you'd probably never run out of money because the chance of making 4 to 5% in the markets over a long period of time is very, very good. Okay, so that's, that's how they do it. And that's how this report does it. But we're still not done, folks, because I still am not satisfied that we have solved all of the risks. So let's just go back for some of you that maybe joined us later. What are retirement income risks? Market volatility. Have we solved market volatility risk? Can anyone tell me, have we solved market volatility risk in option two and three, strategy two and three? Who can tell me, have we? Yes, absolutely. Have we solved longevity risk, outliving your money in strategy number two and number three? Yep, sure have. How about tax risk? Have we solved that? Not entirely, but we've mitigated it. Have we solved the sequence of return risk in options two and three? Yep, we sure have. Healthcare risk, not really. Inflation risk, not really. And debt risk, which I think is one of the biggest risks not being talked about. We have not solved that. So now we've got three risks that we really have not tackled. Okay, taxes, healthcare, inflation. Yes, I'll circle that. Actually, so five risks that we really haven't tackled with options one through three. But we've done a significant job, a, a significantly better job of mitigating risks with the pure volatility buffer strategy. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to strategy number four. And then I'm going to finish with the fifth strategy, which to me is very similar to the fourth strategy, but the ultimate. So now everything's the same. So I, I want you to all realize nothing changed. Sue still retires at 62. Sue still retires with 1.7 million because 300,000 of the $2 million was redirected into a SPIA, a single premium immediate annuity, which kicks off $30,000 a year. So I'm just gonna draw a line. We've guaranteed 30,000 in income for our entire life by doing a single premium. So everything's the same. We redirected that 500,000 that we had in the buy term invested difference into the whole life but we did not just a regular whole life, we did a specially designed and engineered whole life. So now we have 750,000 in death benefit, but now we've only got 800,000 in death benefit. We already know the strategy, okay? It's exactly the same as the last one, except for now we're gonna combine covered asset strategy, 
plus pure volatility strategy. So we are going to use the whole life to support income, which is 50,000. And we're going to take 50,000 from the cash value every time we need income from a downward market so that we don't affect our 401k. So we already got that. We've got a death benefit, which makes sure that that pays out to our family for the rest of our life. We've guaranteed our income. So what are we going to do now? Look at my little sailboat guy. Okay, we're going to do two things. We're going to add a motor to our sailboat. Okay, we're going to put an engine on that sailboat. And we're also going to add some rockets. So how many of you want to go for a ride in Sue's sailboat, which is equipped with a motor so when the wind stops, we get an engine? Diesel powered for efficiency. Got to gotta make all those people happy, you know, that are trying to keep it clean. So we're going to do a super efficient hybrid diesel powered outboard engine. Steven knows more about boats. Does that even exist? A hybrid diesel powered boat engine? Not really. <laughs> you should invent that. Anyway, so that's what we got. But we're also going to add some rockets. But the rockets are solar powered. And the rockets are going to basically make sure that when the engine doesn't go fast enough, we just kick the rockets on. So what is what is all of this? We're going to add a strategy called the infinite banking concept. So here's how this is going to work. Everything's the same as option number three. And I get really excited about this, except for now we're going to apply a strategy called the infinite banking concept, which is going to give us full control of the money in the whole life. It's going to give us a spread on our money. It's going to give us the concept. But why are we going to do this? Well, because I know for a fact that a lot of people are going to go into retirement with debts. Even if you don't have any credit card debt into retirement, I bet you a lot of people are still going to buy new cars. I look at retirees today and I look at their driveways. All of them, for the most part, have brand new cars. And I got to believe that they are leasing or financing those cars. Fair enough? How many of you on here lease or finance your car? Put I in the chat. Okay, John is. Okay, we got Steve. Uh, Salil? Uh, I don't know if I said that right. Give it an attempt. Frederick. So let's just assume now we retire and we've got two cars in our household. Some of you would have three because you have a kid, but you know, you got two cars in your household of which you pay for. And those two cars have loans, car loans. So we have two car loans totaling, you know, let's just say it's, uh, I don't know, what are two cars? Let's just do 60,000. Let's say they're conservative cars. So you got $60,000 in car loans and you're paying $800 a month for those two car payments, 400 and 400. Fair enough. That means every single month you are leaking. So although we've got this awesome boat, We've got a couple holes in the bottom. So we got some water coming up from these few holes and those holes are debts. So the debts are the holes in your boat. We need to plug those. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a loan from the whole life insurance policy. And I did see the questions about whether or not we're paying loan interest on the, the money we take for the last two strategies. The answer would be no, because we didn't take loans during downward markets. We took our cost basis out. We took withdrawals from the whole life. So again, that's, I'm just going off of this strategy, okay? Instead of taking a loan from the whole life, what they're doing is they're doing a strategy called SLURP, Supplemental Life Insurance Retirement Planning, okay? So every option up to this point, those, those withdrawals from the whole life were literally withdrawals against your cash value up to basis. So if you put 500,000 in, we're gonna take 500,000 out. There's no tax consequences. It's tax-free because you're just taking your premiums that you put in out. Fair enough. Then once you exceed 500,000, which was the premiums you paid in, you would switch it to loans. This is a strategy. I did a YouTube video. You can find it. Supplemental life insurance retirement planning, which allows you to then maximize your life insurance, your whole life insurance policy for retirement without ever paying tax on any of the money. It's withdrawals up to basis and then loans. But here we're going to change a little bit. So this is where it gets a little count. Does anyone have any questions on that? Because I, I wanted to make sure I got Jimmy's question out of the way. Are you paying cash value loan interest on those in the prior two? This is only these prior two strategies where we had the cash value and we were taking the 50000 in downward markets. We were not taking loans. I should have covered that. What we were actually doing is we were actually taking withdrawals from the policy, which does deplete the cash value. 
and you don't earn interest on the full amount, every time you take a $50,000 withdrawal, you're, you're earning interest and dividends on 50,000 less. But that's the strategy, okay? I'm not trying to reinvent what these two very smart, numbered and lettered up guys came up with. I'm just going along with what they're saying until this next strategy, all right? Steven, any questions we got to hit before I move on to this? Because this is where it gets real fun. There are a few questions. Let's go through them real quick. What is your opinion? Should you withdraw money from whole life or take a loan during retirement? Yeah, so Rhonda, I just hit that. So in the supplement, the slurp strategy, the, the, the name of the game is you take withdrawals up to basis. Okay, in this case, the basis is 500,000. That's just the number we're picking out of the sky. Okay, up to 500K. Once you get to the 500, or above 500, you take a loan. And that's so that you don't pay taxes. Good question. Okay, so just to clarify, the thirty thousand a year is taxable when taken from the four hundred one k. I was asking about when it was taken from the one payment annuity. Yeah, so here, keep this real simple. Remember, the four hundred one k is taxable income, but the SPIA is still an IRA. Okay, by definition, it's it's an IRA because we just rolled over three hundred thousand of the four hundred one k money into the single premium immediate annuity. It is still by IRS code deemed an I, an IRA. So therefore, it's taxed exactly the same as the 401k. So therefore, the, the withdrawals from the 401k and the withdrawals from the SPIA or the income from the SPIA is all taxable. So the, the taxable income is $80,000 a year. But we already built that into your retirement strategy from day one. The, the distribution strategy accounted for taxes on that money. It just didn't account for increases in the tax rate. How do you mitigate for required minimum payments at 70 and a half if the market is down and you shouldn't take the money from the 401k? Oh, wow. That's a great question, Linda. You don't. So I wasn't going to go here, but Linda, you're, you're going to force me to do this. Can I give you a bonus round? Folks, I, I hope I'm not going too much. We might go a little over. So here's how you do it. Gosh, this is that's a brilliant question. And I'm so glad you asked it. In your, your portfolio, let's just say you got 60, 40. That's your portfolio, but you have risk on both sides. So this is stocks and this is bonds. Okay, 60% stock, 40% bonds. If interest rates go up, your bonds go down, right? So remember, I, I've done this teaching a lot. If interest rates go up, your bond price goes down, which creates risk, volatility risk in the bonds. If the stock market's up, that's great. But if the stock market's down, you got risk in the stocks. So what would you do for RMDs? RMDs stand for Required Minimum Distributions. Those bastards there in Washington have, I don't know if that's where the IRS is, but we'll just blame Washington for everything. Those guys, have guys and gals have figured out how to make sure that we pay tax on all the money we put in our 401ks. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And they did that with a thing called an RMD, which is 70 and a half. Jimmy, did they change that? Because I heard they're changing and pushing that, but let's just go with 70 and a half. At 70 and a half, the IRS is going to tell you how much money you must take from your 401k. Well, let's just say the IRS tells you, you got to take money when the stock market's down 30% and we need to take our RMD. What's the strategy? I would shift the portfolio and I would go 50%, like in this scenario, 50% stock. Let's just say we do 20% bond and I would take and put 30% into a cash management solution. More on that later. We are literally coming up with something that will solve this problem. But let's just call this 30% just goes into a money market or a bank-like account. I hate using that, but a bank account that then would mitigate the 401k money. So if the market's down, we take money from the cash account. Although the cash account isn't making much, we're still going to basically use that cash account to cover RMDs. And 30% might be too much. Maybe it's only 10, actually. So let's just do 50, 40, 10, okay? Maybe that. And then 10% in cash would be enough to cover your RMDs. We would have to calculate that, but does that make sense? That was a great question. All right, let's, let's come over and finish this session up here. Combo strategy. Strategy number four, covered asset plus pure volatility strategy plus the infinite banking concept added. So now, remember in this scenario, we have two cars in the household, $60,000 in car loans, $800 a month. And we're just going to assume that's the only debt they have. Sue has paid off her house. So the only debt she has is her and her husband's car loans. And those are $800 a month. That's still $800 every month coming away from the $30,000 guaranteed income or the $80,000 in income. That's still a pretty, pretty sizable amount of money. And actually, let me just do this yearly so that this makes it easier for everybody to articulate. 800 times 12, that's 
almost $10,000. So $9,600 a year is being leaked in car loans. I can't accept that because now we have debt risk. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take 60 grand of the 750. We're going to pay off these car loans. Okay. So we take a $60,000 loan from the whole life. We pay off the car loans. So the car loans are gone. We take the $800 a month that we used to give to the finance company that financed the cars. And we put that $800 a month back. So I'm just going to kind of draw this back over here. So now we've got $800 a month going back into our whole life, replenishing the money that came out for the car loans. But not only that, what are we also doing? We're recycling and recapturing the interest that we were giving away on the car loans. How much is a car loan interest today? I just looked the other day, 6.8 to 8.9%. That's the range, bankrate.com, look it up. 7%, we'll go with that. So is 7% a good rate of return if our withdrawal rate on our 401k is 5%? If we're taking 5%, would you all be happy making 7% on your 401k in a conservative investment portfolio? You would, because you're making a spread. Well, we literally just filled that spread in even more by just taking back money that you were giving away. So this $800 a month that we took back is actually like making an additional 7%. Does that make sense? It should, right? It's just like making 7%. If you were paying credit cards off, it's probably like making an additional 20% because if you're paying a bank 7% on a car loan, but you no longer are paying the bank and you're now putting the same dollars back into your account, isn't that the same thing? It's the same interest, 800 and 800, it included interest and dividends. And in this scenario, let's just call it 7%, it is. So now what we've done is we've gotten rid of debt risk. I don't care if it's car loans, boat loans, HELOC loans, credit card loans, just replace the car loan with whatever your debt is and use the cash value in the whole life to pay the debt off. Follow what I'm showing you? Anyone have any questions about that? It's brilliant, right? Now, these two gentlemen, uh, what were their names? Wade, Wade and Michael, are they smarter than Chris and Steven now? Who's the smart guy in the room, right? We didn't have to work any harder. We didn't have to work any longer. Sue didn't have to take on any additional risk and we just gave her 7% back. But see, she didn't just make 7%. See, that was kind of tricking you guys. She did not just make 7%. She made 7% plus the interest and dividends earned on the whole life, which let's just say in this scenario is 5.5%. So let's say she's making 5.5% on... $750,000 because now the 60 grand we used to pay off the car loans, that was a loan. We took a loan from that policy to pay off those car loans. So the loan was a, an advance of our death benefit. So now we still have 750,000 earning interest. Now, yes, if we had to take 50 grand here, we would still take a withdrawal up to basis. We would take a withdrawal, but now it doesn't matter that we're taking withdrawals because now we've got money piling back into the whole life policy. And just for all intents and purposes, and I'm going to defy everything I ever teach just because I'm going off the report, the whole lives that they use in the report are whole lives that are fully paid up at the age of retirement. So literally all the whole lives in this report you're going to get, if you ask for it, contact at chrisnoggle.com. It assumes that the whole life policy is paid up at the age of retirement. So there's no more premium deposits going in, which I think is stupid because if I had this policy and I was putting money into it every year, I'd keep putting money into it but that's for another topic. Everybody following where I'm at? So Rick said he's got a unique situation, book a call with us. So we'll put a, a calendar link up on there, book a call with us, and we'll, we'll kind of go into your scenario. Aren't you giving back money you were taking out to pay the car loan anyway? Exactly, Anonymous said a good thing, kind of calling out the obvious monkey in the room. Every, you know, Anonymous is saying, hey, aren't you just uh, giving back the money you were taking out for the car loan anyway? Yeah, he's like, well, isn't that dumb? Well, I don't know, is making an $800 car payment to a bank, is that dumb? I think so. If you had 60 grand in your whole life and you had a $60,000 car loan and you took 60 grand from your whole life and you pay off the car loan, why would you not make the $800 payment back to yourself if you got to keep that $800 every single time it came into your account? Because remember, here's the difference. So you anonymous, think of it this way. If you were making the $800 car payment to a traditional bank or finance company, can you call that traditional bank or finance company the next day and ask them for your $800 car payment back because you need the money? No. 
flip it around. If you were the bank in this scenario, if you're using this strategy and you took 60,000 and you paid off the car loans and you put $800 every single month back in your whole life, is that $800 available the next day if you needed that money? Absolutely. You took back control of your money because you became the bank. But I got one more strategy and, and I'm gonna go completely off the beaten path because some of you are probably watching and listening to this whole report. And this whole report was called Integrating Whole Life Insurance into a Retirement Income Plan, Emphasis on Cash Value as a Volatility Buffer Asset, put together by Wade and Michael. Can't even imagine how much money they paid for this report. But now, some of you are sitting there saying, hey, this is great, but my cars are paid off. I have no credit cards. Our house is paid off. Let's do this exact same strategy. Everything is the same, folks. So I'm not going to redo this because I don't want to waste time. You got your 401k. How much money is in the 401k? Set 1.7. We started with 2 mil. Why is there only 1.7? Because we bought a specially designed whole life or we created our own banking system. I'll start using proper terminology that we have now 750,000 in cash value, 800,000 death benefit. And then we moved 300,000 of the 401k into a SPIA which provided us guaranteed 30,000 in income. So these are all just the same numbers. We added the infinite banking concept to it. So that basically allowed us to make this $750,000 work for us. But the only thing I showed you was debt. Let's just say you got rid of all your debt. Now what? Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to completely diversify outside of normal investments that you are used to in your 401k, which again, I showed, let's just go to the, the ultimate one, the, the 50 the 40 and the 10 for RMDs, okay? This is our RMD cash management. 40% is our bond portfolio. 50% is our stock portfolio, okay? So you got all those RMD, oops. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna invest outside of the traditional realm. So what they would call this is alternative investment strategies. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add IBC, using alternative investments. So let me ask you, uh, what would be the ultimate alternative investment that all of you could think about? Like if you were a bank, what would be the number one thing you would want to do? Okay, make a spread. But what do banks do to make a spread? Loan money. That's, the, that's what I was looking at. Lend. The ultimate investment or, for, or alternative investment is lending. Making loans in a secured I would say first secured position. So we're going to become the bank. We're going to BYOB. We hear that all the time by us, which means we're going to lend money in a first secured position, and then we can control all the terms. So you can control how long you want to lend that money, at what percentage rate you want to... Actually, let's go into percentage rate. If you were going to lend money, how much would you want to make today? The magic. I love that. 15%, okay? Okay. Can we get 15%? Can anyone, does anyone know where to get 15%? Who can tell me where you can get 15%? I'm just going to take a wild stab that I know the answer, but yeah, private money club. Well, let's just see. Can we earn 15%? Because that sounds like a hell of a big number, right? 15% interest. I mean, are you going to get 15% consistently in, in, in the stock market? So we could come on here and we could look, whoa, look at that. Single family house needs rehab, 15% APR. Okay, but let's, let's go a step further here. Go into the dashboard. Let's look at the deals page. You're right, Frederick, five to 8% would be about accurate for a diversified stock portfolio. And everything's slow here, folks. We're moving out of this office into our new studios. So the internet's a bit spotty. So here we go. Can we make 15%? Well, here's 20 rehabbing an eight unit. That's actually probably a really good deal. 18, we got Dwight and Brandon, 24% bridge loan, 15%, 12, 12. Dwight and Brandon, they're always 12%. 12.66, 13. So is everybody convinced that if we wanted to find 15% first secured, we probably could, there's a 20, there's a 15, there's a 20, holy shit, 25. All right, so anyway, I've proven with a pure guess that we can find 15% on Private Money Club. So now we wanna make 15%. So what are we gonna do? Well, 
we're going to basically create an account on Private Money Club. And we're going to literally do the same thing I just showed you a second ago. We're going to then take money from the whole life. Now, let's call it 200000 We're going to lend in first secured position 200 k on PMC at 15%. So now, Stephen, can you do the math for me? You got a calculator here? I can probably do it quicker. So we got 200 k times 0.15 divided by, well, that's 30 grand. That's 2,500 bucks. 2,500 bucks a month. So now all we're going to do is we're going to use some of the cash value in that specially designed whole life to create another ancillary income in this, the lowest risk way we can, which is a secured position just like a bank. You want to be the bank? Then do just what a bank does. Think like a bank. So we're going to lend it out first secured position at 15% which is going to give us 2500 which is $30,000. So now let's just let's just look at what we just did here. Volatility buffer plus covered asset strategy plus IBC plus P I'll just write PMC. It's a mouthful. Don't try to explain this to anybody they won't understand. Just say, "Ah, it's this it's this fifth it's the fifth strategy." <clears throat> so we have solved the liquidity issue and the market risk with the 10% into the cash management for RMDs. We have solved the asset buffer with a permanent life insurance policy where the death benefit gets paid out upon your death no matter how long you live. We covered 30,000 worth of income using a SPIA. Then we just added another $30,000 worth of income from lending 200,000 of the 750,000. So now we have covered 60,000 of the $80,000 needed so the only draw that we need on the 401k now is $20,000 a year. Hold on, let's do the math. So 20,000 and we have $1.7 million. So 20,000 divided into 1.7. All we need to draw our 401k down is 1.2%. So our drawdown rate on the 401k is now only 1.2%. What are your chances of running out of money here? What are your chances? I would say slim to none. There's always a chance. Can't guarantee this stuff because this is still investing over here, but you're making a huge spread and you're controlling all the risk because you are in a secured position. You, you controlled the term. You, you had all, all the control in the world, just like a bank does. We've guaranteed a huge portion of our retirement income, making it so we only need 1.2% to come out of the 401k. So the 401k gets to stay invested for the long term, earning market-based returns and just growing until we need to take RMDs, of which we're going to take RMDs from the 50-40 portfolio. And when the market's down, we'll take them from our cash management position. Holy shit, Stephen, I think we have literally just knocked it out of the park. And let's just let's just talk about the other risks that before we hadn't covered. We didn't cover healthcare risk, the cost of healthcare going up. If we're only drawing 1.2% from our 401k, do you think we could increase that to like 1.8% or 2% if healthcare went up? And then let's just say taxes went up a bunch and and we need to take more than 80 grand. Do you know, do you think it'd be okay if we took this up from two from 1.2 to 2.5%? You think we'd be okay? Probably would never run out of money. Yeah. I mean, because you know, drawdown rates, four to 5% conservatively. So we've covered tax risk. We've covered healthcare risk. We've covered market volatility risk, sequence of return risk, living too long. We covered that. We made sure that our family's always going to get something. They're going to get the remaining amount of the 401k that we don't spend. And we don't want to use the money in the 401k if we don't have to, because why? Because we got to pay tax on that money. Yes, we're going to pay tax on the 30,000, but what if we just only took what the government told us to take from the 401k because the rest of it was covered somewhere else? That, would, that wouldn't be so bad. And then if you had a big expense you needed to take, sure, you could take it from the 401k. You could also take it from the whole life. You have options now. And the last risk that I didn't talk about is inflation, which inflation is a short-term risk. It is a, a, a temporary risk because inflation, yes, it's always there, but hyperinflation is usually short term. So therefore, we just need to usually buffer it for a couple of years. Now, didn't we show you how to buffer? We did. If inflation were really high and the cost of goods and services went up, we built a buffer here because now we're only taking with tax risk, healthcare risk, we're only taking 2.5. So for a few years, maybe we bump it up to 5%. 
We got our whole life and now we're lending our whole life money out. So the whole life cash value, which I haven't talked about at all, the whole life cash value is indeed going up every single year. So you're making more and more money here. And as your cash value goes up, you're increasing your death benefit too. We didn't talk about any of that. Do you see why I got excited this weekend? I got really excited this weekend because I got this idea planted in my mind, this, this really good idea. And the idea was posed by the team, by Craig and Steven, and I think even Shauna. They said, hey, we haven't done a video on you or on a YouTube video on retirement. Let's redo that supplemental life insurance retirement planning one. I said, yeah, but that's kind of old news. And that's just, that's just kind of one, it's one-sided. And then I found this by searching this report and I started reading this report and then it brought back all the good stuff that I learned as a financial advisor, but then I still realized there was a bunch of holes. So I sat down and I started thinking about how do we plug those holes? And this is what I came up with. So can I just ask a question from the audience? Do you think Stephen and I are smarter, smarter than Wade and Michael? Just asking for a friend. Yes. All right. Thank you, Paul. I know, I know that might not be the, the case, but uh, I feel pretty smart right now. So let's answer some questions. Yeah. So Sam was just saying, would you snap a picture of that awesome boat drawing for him? <laughs> you want the one with the rockets? All right. Let's give you the... Oh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but... My final uh, strategy, number five, you got the boat, the sailboat with the engine, which is, remember, a hybrid diesel and electric engine. And then we've got rockets, which are solar powered. So now our guy's got a hat and sticking his tongue out. Is that the one you want, Sam? I there think you I like the solar, the solar powered rocket one too is pretty cool. Well, this one's a solar powered rocket too. Okay. All right. We're good then. Yeah. All right. Martin said, would you advise someone who is just starting to work to put money in a 401k? Oh, that's a good question. Up to the match, yes. So if your company matches, let's just say dollar for dollar, you get uh, 3%, then you should put in 3% because that's like getting a free 3%. Now, remember, there's always going to be a vesting period. So it's usually cliff vesting of six years, whatever. Ask what the vesting period is and just know that you got to work there for that long in order to get that matched money or, or get a portion of that matched money. But I would always tell people, uh, put at least the match amount in. So if your company matches dollar for dollar up to 4%, put 4%. And if they match dollar for dollar up to 6%, put 6% in. But a lot of them are doing this tricky thing where they're saying, oh, we'll match 50 cents on the dollar up to 6%. Can anyone do the math? How much are you actually getting? 3%. But what do you have to do? Put in six to get the three. Do you know why they do that? The more money that is in the 401k, the more money you put in the 401k, the less the fees are. So then the, the business owner who sponsored the plan or allowed the plan to be offered is paying less and less out of their 401k because the fees in the overall plan go down as the assets go up. Cool. And, and one thing, I didn't see any other question. One thing I wanted to mention, Chris, was a lot of this stuff we're talking about, it's not hypotheticals. Like this is real, um, very easily done and accomplished, you know, with a little bit of education. So on the whole life side, especially on the whole life side, that's what we do all day, every day. So schedule a call with our team. We can help you with that. If you're looking to set up the single premium um, media annuity, anything like that, we can help with that as well. Just reach out to us. And, you know, things like a 15% annual private loan in a first position. I mean, those pop up all the day. We just had, um, I mean, Chris, one of your, your mentors was on Money Club Mondays. He's one of the premier members of Private Money Club, Dr. Greg Reed has an awesome deal. And, and what I, and I posted the link over in the chat box uh, the, for the YouTube replay of that Money Club Monday, as well as the direct link on Private Money Club. But I talked to Greg this morning. He's raised um, almost all of the money. I think he was raising 1.2, 1.3 million total, um, but it's a first position. And he said he's still got room for a few more lenders. Um, so that's like real, you know? And, and, and what's really cool about the community with Private Money Club is, okay, you're lending, it's first position, the money's protected, it's uh, you know, you can learn about the borrower. In my opinion, Greg Reed's probably one of the most stand-up guys you'll ever meet, but do your own research, obviously. But, you know, so you know that kind of stuff right up front, but it's in 15% is incredible returns. Like we just talked about, you die to get that in the market consistently. Uh, but the cool thing is, is when you're dealing in private lending and relationships, you can have fun with it. So like one thing that Dr. Greg is doing is he hosts these masterminds, Secret Knock and Prosperity Camp. And he's got this new one coming out that he's doing at this new property. And he's giving investors, he's giving lenders 
tickets to come to the events that are like five, ten thousand dollar tickets. So it's like not only do you have cool monthly interest coming in um, through the the private loan, but now you get invited to actually come meet him in person and his network and network with him. And Chris, you you know as well as I do, he's got one of the the largest networks of of multimillionaires and business owners and people like that than maybe anybody we know. So uh, I would it's kind of cool. Just like stuff like that is what I love, love, love about Private Money Club. I mean, I was talking with Noah. Harris, who's a, a premier borrower in private money club today. And he said, Hey, Stephen, I'm going to post a deal before my event this weekend. Um, so hopefully somebody funds it. And uh, that way I can talk about it this weekend for you guys at the event and, and how I use private money club to fund it. And he texts me again, literally 11 minutes later, I see and said that. the deal's already funded. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? It was just like, it happens just like that too, which is so cool. Oh my God. I was just reading that text here. Cause when you were talking, I went on to speaker mode and I was reading that and it's crazy. Like he posted a deal and it took him 11 minutes to get it funded. Um, it's just wild. I mean, private money club is changing people's lives. Uh, not just the borrowers who are getting funds for their deals like Greg Reed and, you know, the Fullers and, and Noah, but also the lenders who just like I just showed you on the example are now making far greater returns in a secured position than they would make in a volatile stock market right now. I mean, the markets are bouncing, ping-ponging up and down today, but yesterday they were down almost 400 points. I mean, how does that feel when you see the news, it shows the stock market down 400 points, and you know that you're retired and you need to take an income draw next month, and it's going to come out of a, a downward stock market. Like, it's just, these are the things I'm trying to get all of you to understand. Like, you don't have to follow the traditional financial advice. There are solutions. And, and I think today what this did is this gives all of you this report done by someone totally different outside of our sphere of influence. These people don't, these two guys don't know who we are, but they did a report mathematically showing you the different strategies. They do five different strategies, which are going to be different than what I showed from, from three on, but they show you mathematically that buy term invested difference is not the best strategy. So integrating the whole life into it with the SPIA and the infinite banking concept literally might be the ultimate retirement strategy. And uh, really the next decision for all of you is, do you want to apply this? Is this something you think would help you and your family? Is this something you want to learn more about? And if you do, Stephen, put the link up to schedule a call. Um, the reports that we would do for the SPIAs and putting together this strategy would be done in conjunction with Craig Yenny and our team. We have the software that he has created that can show these, these strategies. I do wanna preface one thing. Let's say some of you book a call with us and you wanna do a strategy similar to this. You're gonna have to give us a little bit more time than normal. This kind of planning is intensive and it's very uh, time consuming for us to build a full retirement distribution plan like what you saw. So just kind of planting the seed. If you do book a call with us, just have a little patience. It's gonna take us probably a good week to put together your full plan and we're going to need lots of information from you but then once we deliver it the decision's all yours we are not here to try to sell you anything we are here to solve your problem and if what we give you solves your problem then you and only you can ask us to help you do that and then our team will go to work for you just like we have for eight thousand plus other people yeah that's all i got i hope you guys enjoyed that uh we actually have some pretty good comments so jimmy was saying and on top of that, save any current year's tax savings you receive by investing in the 401k. Uh, most never think to do this. And then Shane was saying, would you recommend up to a match of 8,000 if it's a 25% match or 2,000 from the company? I've never ever seen that. I've never in my life seen a match that high. And I would, I would, I would literally call the bluff. Well, no, no. What he's saying is Oh, sorry. You put up to eight thousand in, and they'll match twenty five percent of that. So two thousand. So if you put eight in, they match two, or if you put four in, they match one. I don't love Gosh, that. But... I don't. I I can't say yes or no, uh, just because I don't know enough about your circumstances and your situation. But let me just put it this way: if that were me, I would be putting no money into that four hundred one k. He said I've been focusing. That's just me. He said, I've been focusing on just using my extra cash flow to go into additional investments right now. Yep. And then and then Jimmy added. Um, and just so everybody knows, James Davidson, who's commenting over here, is in our inner circle, attends our experienced masterminds. Uh, awesome guy out in California. We should live closer, Jimmy. Still got to get to Costa Rica with you. But um, 
just a high level accountant. So he said, if your 401k annual investment being matched by the employer saves you 6,000 incurring your tax savings, why not fund an infinite banking system with that savings, which is very smart. Yeah, and, and Jimmy's a CPA. So, you know, you can take some tax advice from him. You cannot take tax advice from us. We can't give you tax advice because we are not CPAs. And I love that Rhonda just said that. And, and this is another, on the contrary, another comment came in from Rhonda. She said, my spouse gets 100% match up to 6% because they got rid of the pension. So lots of companies are ditching traditional divine, defined benefit pension plans, and they're replacing them with 401ks, but they're giving higher matches. So in that scenario, what Rhonda's spouse is doing, putting in up to the 6% makes all the sense in the world, because number one, the 6% is that they're getting matched. That's a pretty good amount. Um, I don't know what the vesting schedule looks like, but it still makes a lot of sense if they're going to be there for you know, the long haul past that, that vesting schedule. And Patrick and uh, my Clark said, uh, can you add a SPIA after a policy has been done? You can add a SPIA anytime you want. It's, it's just think of it like a bolt on, like, you know, you just want to bolt it onto your retirement. It, it's very easy to do. They are 100% guaranteed, just like the whole life policy. Uh, there's not a lot of moving parts. We, we basically go to an insurance company. We tell them the dollar amount, that, you know, we're looking to solve for. You want 2,500 a month, 1,000 a month, 800 a month, 10,000 a month. We put that into their system and it tells us how much money we would need to put in a SPIA. And then there gives us different options. So we can custom tailor any single premium immediate annuity SPIA that somebody wants. And you can do it with qualified retirement funds or non-qualified. But, but let me stop you. If you have non-qualified funds, please consult with us before putting non-qualified funds into a SPIA. I think you're going to be far better off building your own banking system and doing what I showed you on that last slide, because that's going to that's going to be a much better return. Well, I'm really excited we were able to do this, folks. Um, you know, we we talk so much about the infinite banking concept. We talk about a lot of things on this show, but this is the first time ever we were able to literally do something of this nature. And I hope it helps a lot of you because I do know a lot of people want to retire and they want to retire with the least amount of risk and the least amount of uncertainty. And I hope today what we showed you paints that picture that it is possible. All you need to do is think outside the box. With that being said, thank you for joining us for today's wealth webinar and join us this afternoon at 4.30 for Ask Me Anything. And with that being said, we'll see everybody next time. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.